Right. Okay, so uh, Marcus, right? Hopefully we've all brought three in with us. Uh, they'll look something like this. Did anyone... You've got Copix, terrific. I can see more Copix here. Anyone's got a different brand of marker? I've got some cheaper LBs. Let's have, a, let's have a look at those. Let's have a look at those. But everyone's primarily got Copix? Yes. Great. Then I can focus on Copix except for whatever Jason's got here. <laughs> which we'll have a look at in a sec. No, I've got, I've got a Copix as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, can I, yeah, uh, we'll give one a crack in a sec as well. <laughs> Whatever brand this is, graphic marker, that's cool. In fact, if I just do this. Ooh, yeah, they're good. <laughs> that reminds me of the 80s. <laughs> All right. That's how markers used to smell. All right. So. Uh, anyway, Copic markers, they are, you've got the little identifier at the top for the colours, you can buy them in sets like this, where we have uh, the gradient, you don't need to go and buy this, you just see the three that we've, we've got today. You will notice that they come with two ends on them, okay, you've got a, a, point, uh, a fine tip, and then you have a chisel tip which uh, is probably going to be a bit of fun for you to, <laughs> to get used to rendering with. Um, one of the reasons we suggest Copics is because they're serviceable. So these tips come out, and then let's say you've done so much rendering that you've worn the tip out, you can go and buy a replacement uh, pack. You can also buy different types like brush, uh, nibs, a whole host of things. But what you guys are doing in here, off the shelf, stock uh, option is the way to go. Now, when we are applying the marker, all right, um, you'll generally do most of your work with, with the chisel tip. Okay, it's probably going to look a bit weird because I'm left-handed and most of you are right-handed, so it's always weird looking the other way around. Okay, so it's, you put it on the page and you can feel it. It stays wet, you can feel it's damp. Depending on what paper you're using, it might stay damp for up to a minute, depending on how much marker you put on the page. You saw what I did there, I just put two strokes over each other. Um, hot tip for the day, when you are using your earlier work as an underlay, do not start uh, doing the darker marker. Do not leave your underlay under the page because it bleeds through. Okay, you see how much that's bleeding through on the other side there? Mm -hmm. Right, so always work with a, a sacrificial piece of paper underneath. Don't work straight onto like the laminated tabletop either because what you'll find is that the marker will pull under there and it won't dry and you'll end up putting too much marker on and it'll tear a hole through the paper. So I'm just giving you all these tips that no one ever told me about but um, are useful. Now, once, once the mark has gone off, so that's that C2 that we put on there first up. I might just try and focus that a little bit better in that area. Okay. You can layer up the marker by putting another coat on it. So you can see there now how we now have a darker tone. Okay, so it started off as a C2. It's probably become a C3 now. Okay, now we can just feel that. We can let it dry. Um, we'll do the same thing with the C6 that we put on here. So we just give that another hit as well. And you can see we've got a darker tone. So these things are quite good because you can keep layering them up. Eventually, the paper will get to a point where it's super saturated and it won't take anymore. But you can see there with the third, third layer, we're getting a bit more um, uh, of a tone again. So that idea of these things being slightly translucent and that you can layer them up, that's an important concept. That's why we're only working with three markers and you don't need the whole 12 set here because you can do things by uh, being strategic with how you layer things up. All right. Um, now, when it comes to actually putting the marker on the page, let's say we have 
a square area that we are trying to fill. Like I said, it's not important what I'm actually rendering here. So just as long as you guys can see it, that's... Let's say we had two square areas that we were, we were trying to fill. Okay, so we've done our underlay, we traced it off. And I want to fill that with... Uh, let's pick a four. Alright. So, given maybe some of your experiences, last time you, some of you might have rendered, it might have been... Um, year two at primary school and you might have got the Crayolas out and you might have just kind of just randomly you know kind of coloured things in like that and you just sit there and talk to your friend for a little while and kind of talk for a little bit and we've forgotten that we've got this marker on the page that's rapidly drying so we come back to it and and we start scribbling a bit more. Now you can kind of see that that hasn't really gone on there real even, has it? It's kind of a bit blotchy, like even just from the quality of the projector there, you can tell that it's not even. Now markers, generally you can get quite an even finish on them if you're a bit strategic about where you put the marker on the page. So before you commit to putting anything on the page, be scared. Okay. You need to think what is the best way to drive this marker around the page to fill the, the shape that I'm trying to fill. Now you want to do something uh, where you maintain the wet front of the marker. So you want to keep that uh, damp marker going across the area that you're trying to fill. As you saw from, from this first one that I did here, okay, we let that, that that marker dry off. Then when I put the fresh marker over the top, because it is kind of translucent how this works, you end up with this odd bleeding going on here. And that's not always desirable. Sometimes it is desirable. When you can put it on reasonably flat, that's when you can start uh, messing with it. So let's say we're gonna fill this, this area at the top here. All right. I've got to think of a way to drive the marker around there so that I can try and fill this as quickly as possible and not get the, uh, the streaking that we can often get when we're not overly careful with applying our marker. So what I would do is I would probably build out from a corner, okay? And then I go backwards and forwards to see how I'm overlapping that previous stroke. And I'm also ever so slightly rotating the marker and adjusting that chisel tip as I go around to fill the area that I want to fill. All right, so you, you're constantly kind of rolling these markers around in your hands. Sometimes you want the full flat stroke. Other times you want just like a really fine stroke out of that tip. Sometimes you want something a bit different again. This will take you a bit of time to get used to. All right. Um, five or six years, you'll be fine. It won't, it won't take that long. You'll be fine. <laughs> All right, but, but you can already see how much flatter that one has turned out compared to the bottom one. So that, that idea of, of rendering by overlapping the stroke or working quickly so that you can blend things together while we have that wet front happening is an important one to keep in mind. That'll take you some time. That's that's especially when we start rendering up, you know, shapes that are in perspective. We have little areas, and I'll do a little demo of that a little bit later. But the idea of overlapping strokes that's that's important. Now, I'm gonna try and we're gonna zoom in a little bit here. We're gonna zoom in just down there. Now I've got a bunch of different pens. I have Biro. I have fine liner. Let's pull all these down this way. I have Copic fine liner. And oh, these are erasable pens. Oh, damn, why didn't you tell me about erasable pens at the start of the semester? All right. Three different pens. And what we're interested in 
is looking at how they behave when you apply marker over the top of them. All right, so, biro. Fairly heavy stroke of biro. All right, light biro. Now we're gonna to switch to, just go to 0.4. Most of you probably have 0.4s. Okay, very 0.4 art line. Copic, 0.2 Copic fine liner. Cheap friction. You seen these things? Yeah. Look at that. God, you guys didn't have to be making mistakes with some SE friggin' brazen these things. <laughs> nah. <laughs> right. What we are interested in, I'm going to use my C2. And we're going to try and zoom in on this little area here. So with my C2, I'm going to go over the top with the marker. Now, are you guys seeing that kind of smudging going on there? Is that? Yeah. Look at that. That's that's horrible. All of a sudden, that stroke has gone about five times the width that it was before, and uh, it's probably not desirable if we weren't expecting it. Even with the light biro. That's really saturated with that and it's become like a purpley, purpley blue. All right, here's our art line. Not too bad, a bit more stable, but it is still bleeding. And, and the thing you might be noticing, it's probably a bit hard to see up on the screen there, but it's about 30 seconds ago, 40 seconds ago, and the biro is still bleeding. Now the art line is really getting quite blotchy down there as well. This is not good. 0.2 Copic. Oh, that's better. That's better. That's not. That's not bleeding at all. Friction. Friction's pretty good too. That's not bleeding at all. So, where this? Where does this lead us? So if we zoom right into that, the friction did fade a bit. Now that actually might not be a bad thing though. So when you start to think of your workflow, start to think about the order that you're gonna be putting things on the page. So generally we're doing our sketches with um, biro or fine liner, and then previously we've been maybe adding some hatching, or then you would do a clean overlay. And if it's a black and white thing like we've been doing so far, those clean overlays are fine, you add a bit of hatching and, and it's done. Now, in this situation, what you might want to do is do your overlay where you use the biro really, really lightly, okay? Or you use the fine liner really, really lightly. Or you use one of these friction pens because they're not bleeding at all. And then what you do is once you've got your marker on the page, then come back in and once that marker is dry, put your line work on over the top. Now what's going on here is because these these uh, different pens are they've got different solvents going on essentially. The reason I was smelling the one that Jason gave me here earlier is this one. They I don't think they make them like this anymore. Man, that's that's awesome. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we used to have really good solvents that dried super quick, like like these ones, and then I think you know, they worked out they were making people infertile and causing cancer and all that kind of stuff. So, so everything got a little bit more everything got a little bit more environmentally friendly, but let me tell you when you were doing an all nighter to get your work done, they kept you awake. Okay. Um, so that work think, think about that workflow because because another another little thing we can try here, let's say, you know, let's say we have we have a line that we're trying to render up to. And I'm going to leave a millimeter gap there. 
not really in focus, but that's... All right, so that after, after this is kind of, you know, it's still feeling a little bit damp, that's actually bled up to that line. Huh. All right, and it's kind of like a barrier, so it'll just kind of, it will kind of stop. It's when you saturate the line work that it, that it really does start to bleed. So my suggestion is do a really light overlay, hit it with marker, then do your final line work. Another way to do it might be to photocopy your original because the photocopy ink is much more stable. Yep. Um, what about pencil? Glad you asked. <laughs> Glad you asked. We definitely don't use lead pencil. No, I don't think anyone does. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's look at what happens with pencil. So let's say we have a, have a pencil, and this is Faber-Castell, one of the ones I recommended. The other one was Bruce McCullough. Okay. Now let's put that marker over the top of the pencil. Uh, picks it all up and, and drags it out. But I actually, I want to use that a little bit later because that's a really cool thing to have to get that gradient and get another essentially another tone by smudging the the pencil so yes and no the pencil can be helpful you might notice in some rendering videos some of the designers will use like a, a light blue pencil um, as their underlay and it's often with a really waxy pencil and it, by the time you've got your marker on and you put your uh, line work on that blue disappears Okay, and it's a bit like these construction lines too. Like it's it's really obvious when when I do this and go, oh yeah, look at the bleed. But I actually like making use of that that bleeding effect too, because you, you're adding a bit of. Um, it doesn't look like the computer has drawn it there. It has a bit more of a maybe artistic value, dynamic value if there is if there is in, uh, that kind of movement in there. But the thing is, if, if you're not expecting it, that's when it bites you. All right, so I'm just point, pointing out these things to you today all right so one of the first things we want to do is um, is to work a gradient look at that all right so and oh it's gone to the other one as well so you probably want to have a couple of pieces of sacrificial paper underneath your main sheet remember always get rid of those underlays from underneath because they will get trashed um, actually, just on paper. So the paper I'm using here is just the standard photocopy stuff. It's the 70 GSM. Now you can, and a lot of designers will recommend this. I don't. Okay, you can get stuff called bleed proof paper. All right, it has like a chemical coating on the front side of the paper. Um, supposed to stop markers from bleeding. Kind of does but I also find it actually slows down the workflow as well because the marker then takes longer to dry on top. Um, also, it's, what was this? This was $16 for a pad of it. How many reams of A3 photocopy paper is that? I'm interested in quantity, not quality at this point. So if, if you're having issues with the, the bleeding or that kind of stuff, you're feeling rich, maybe go out and get yourself a pad of bleed proof. But I don't recommend it. Alright, I, I, I think just stick with the, know the limitations of the, of the uh, photocopy paper that you have and, and that'll be fine. There's no need to drop heaps of money on, on bleed proof uh, paper for what we're doing in here. Uh, it's not like when you do watercolour painting and you kind of need that special paper that can, that can take watercolours. Alright, so we are looking at doing uh, some gradients. Okay, so how do we start doing doing some of that stuff? So um, I've asked you just to trace the rectangular box off of the, the page that I've given you, and we want to try and make a gradient that goes from the lightest marker you've got to the darkest. So in this case, I'm going to work with the C6, the C2, 
and a C4, all right? That's the, the three that I'm going to use here, but this will work equally well with a C1, C3, and C5. And some people will say work from light to dark. Others will say work from dark to light. I just, I don't think I have an opinion on that, so whatever, whatever suits you. Um, I have given you kind of four grid lines as well to work with. And what we're trying to do is build a relatively smooth gradient using using the marker. So I'm going to work just back from the start. And I'm just going to apply in those overlapping strokes in this rectangular box to C2. Then while that's still drying, pick up the C4. And we'll apply that in overlapping strokes. And then somewhere around about here, I'm going to pick up my C6 and just pick up on the last stroke there. So why I hit them so quickly back to back is I want them to bleed into each other a little bit. And you see how I'm not being totally precious with the top and bottom line work there either because I know that's going to bleed. I'm going to come and fix that up afterwards with one nice big fat point six line afterwards. Um, and that way the workflow is quicker because I'm not concerned about totally keeping within within the lines. Now I'm going to come back down here. I can still feel that's kind of wet. So while that's kind of wet, because these are nice fresh juicy markers as well, when your markers get a little bit drier, um, they, they won't stay as damp on the page for as long. And you remember before we started to layer these things up, so I put on like a second layer and then I ended up getting a darker tone. All right, so I'm still practicing that here. And I'm going to hit with my C4 and just kind of bleed this all a little bit more as well. So you don't, you don't know exactly how that gradient is going to work until it's, it's properly dry. And someone like that, yeah. <laughs> right, so we're going we're gonna to leave that just dry there for a little bit now while that's happening. Like I said, I'm not concerned about the, the line weights of the underlay lines, but I'm going to fix that now with my point 0.6. And you can see now that we've gone over the top how that mark is dry. We don't notice that. The tops and the bottoms weren't weren't perfectly spot on. Now that's really looking wrinkly there. I think it's because see the paper's starting to buckle a little bit from being loaded up so much. That's not like a really wobbly line for me. Trust me, that's right, it's kind of straight. <laughs> now I did I did peek a little bit early because I put my black line on before before the marker was dry. All right, so you can see it's, it's bled under the, the second layer of marker. I should have been a bit more patient. The lesson for you guys for today: be a little bit more patient. Right, answer to you all. Now here's where our pencils come in. Once those markers are nice and dry, as well, once those layers of marker have come in, nice and dry. You can hit them over the top with, with these nice soft pencils that you've brought with you. And, and they help give more tone as well. But now the white, this is not what you're doing. Okay, so just to be clear, but I just want to prove a point that once that marker is nice and dry, you can put nice white highlights back into, back into the uh, drawing. And, and we could even go up the top here and hide some of that bleeding that went on earlier. Not that we're going to hide that, but because there, there was nothing to see there anyway. But, um, and then we could, we could ease this back in as well with a bit, little bit of white, white pencil, but these, just the white and black adds to the versatility of those three gray markers that you've got. So pretty quickly you can start to develop that, that color gradient. All right, now rendering up the, the cube that we want to look at today. Um, again, we, we know what the cube is, so pr you're probably more interested in just looking back at the rendering tape play so you're okay if I keep going from this weird angle yep all right uh, so let's let's sketch up our cube 
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to use the friction pan here. Okay, so that's that's going to be my underlay. And based on what I know from using the friction pan, yeah, I'm aware that it's probably going to um, erase a little bit. And because we, we started learning shadows last week, let's put a shadow on there as well. Again, um, I don't mind whether we start with light or dark, but the light source is going to be coming from over our left shoulder. Okay. And the top surface, I've given you a bit of a paint by numbers on page three of today's exercise. And if you haven't got cool gray markers, you can interchange the C with a T or an N or whatever you have. But essentially, we're going to say that the, the top face of the cube is going to be the lightest marker that you have. The left hand face is going to be the mid, mid tone that you have and the right hand face is going to be the darker one. So we're imagining that the light is coming over the top and, and hitting our cube from there. Now on each side face we will do some, some gradient as well. So I'm going to start with the, the C6 and this is where again I've got to think about how I'm going to drive this marker around the page. This, this has got a hell of a lot more complicated because like when I colored in those squares earlier that was just up and down. That was pretty simple. I don't really have an up and down with this one because it's like this skewed kind of face. So, all right, here we go. Um, I'm going to try and drive it from the corner. Okay, you can see I'm trying to get as close as I can to the top. And because I'm going up and down, I'm able to get to that edge. And then while that's all still wet, let that bleed together. Now, yeah, it's looking a bit blotchy at the moment, but I'm not too concerned with that because it's just the first layer. C4 is for this side here, so now I've got to think about how I drive that one as well. So this time around, I'll do things a little bit differently. I'm going to do it this way. It's a bit like when you draw straight lines without a ruler. You've probably got a natural direction that, that you can work with quite easily based on how your body operates. Um, the other thing, I don't know if you caught it there when I filled in this space and the first space is that that marker was again getting rotated, right? So when I need to rotate it to the pointy end of the chisel tip, I was doing that and then uh, nice big flat, um, even uh, strokes with the, the, the wedge fully flat um, elsewhere. Now I want to give a bit of a hot spot in this area here, so I'm going to start with the C2 across the top here, and I'm deliberately going to try and try and streak it this time, just to give it that effect that maybe there's a bit of a hot spot there from the shimmering. Yeah, it's, it's shimmering, and we're starting to indicate a little bit of material here as well. So this might be uh, a, a gloss or a semi-gloss type finish. Yeah, yep. We'll often use grey markers to describe form more than materials. When we go for materials, it could be coloured markers or it could be a Photoshop or Illustrator rendering or even into 3D. So, um, unfortunately, the days are gone where you guys get to spend eight hours doing one coloured rendering. Those days are long gone. Um, the computer has replaced that for us. Now, on the instructions that I've given you, I've recommended, and if, if you get... Like, I recommend having little bits of reference geometry around you because then you'll start to see all this stuff for real and how form and light affects how surfaces get painted. So if we did have a light source coming in from over here on the left hand side, instinct tells us that the darkest spot is going to be at the bottom of the cube over here. But what actually starts to happen is, and maybe we can simulate it here with this marker, to a degree, if, if you have a look at the top edge there, that's actually darker than the bottom. Because what's happening is you've got a white piece of paper and you're getting this fall off effect, you're getting light bouncing back up off of the ground. So in this case, which is why I've given you the paint by numbers to add another layer here, we're going to make this top surface the darker one. And you see I'm kind of being a little bit streaky with that as well because I want it to almost have like a, a graduated tone 
and it adds, it makes it look a little bit more dynamic as well. If you're not confident enough to go dynamic, just go flat. But by the time that dries off, that'll look kind of interesting. I'm going to hit with the C2 over on the right hand side, just to from the bottom there, just to build up a little bit of depth on that side. And maybe just another little hit of the C2 across the top. And that's probably done. We can let that dry now. Um, I won't rush like I did with the first one and have things bleeding everywhere. But I'm also interested in putting a shadow on here as well. Now, I haven't asked you for colored shadows, but because I've got one, I'm going to put a blue shadow on there to maybe indicate that this thing is on maybe a blue piece of paper or a blue surface. Okay. And you see I'm burying the, how I'm using the tip there on the marker. Because I want, you know, people put shadows or vignettes in the background and often they look more interesting than the object itself. So try to make the object be the thing that pops out first, not the shadow or the vignette behind the image. Okay, now one other thing I might do here is just come in with a bit of black pencil to further add a bit of gradient to that side surface. And I might use my white pencil from the top here just to gradient that surface a little bit more. Maybe just a little bit of white down that front edge and across the top. So this is where you can start to tighten up those lines that weren't quite right. Now you can see the original line work that I had there, that's basically gone. That underlay line work is gone. So now is where, where I can put in my final line work and this is the, the real moment where you've got to clench, have a deep breath because you can't undo this. And now we can put our final line work on there. First time you guys have seen me draw a little pen, but yeah, no undo button. Alright, so we come over and so all of a sudden now all those those uh, I guess where the marker had bled, we've now controlled that around the outside. I'd like to put a bit more definition around the top there as well. So I'm coming in with a, a thinner fine liner just to tighten those edges up. So, and where the, where the little, you know, we're being a bit pedantic here, but where the little uh, pointy tip of the marker comes in handy, sometimes you just see these little spots that you just want to fix up. My advice is, don't try and fix it because you'll mess the whole thing up, you'll overwork it. But uh, you will overwork it. <laughs> You know, the, the real skill is like having having the ability to go, you know what, that's enough, move on to the next sketch, rinse it in the design. All right, so that's what we kind of end up with. Oh, is there anything you use white pencil instead of white pen? Yeah, the, the white pens are good if you can get those gel inks. And what we'll do next semester, if you stick with this, is we'll end up using uh, like wipeout or gouache. Yep, yep. Um, poster paint for those for those uh, real highlights. Uh, the pencil, just because it's, I don't want you guys to have to buy too much today, so we can um, use it. Well. Yeah, yeah. You know, these both of these brands, the Faber Castell and the Prismacolor, they're they're really nice and white. Now, one thing you do want to have by your side as well is a good pencil sharpener or scalpel, so that you can. Here's where I do myself an injury and it's recorded. <laughs> and I don't get the workers comp payout because I wasn't practicing safe WHS or SOP. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, nothing happened here, guys. <laughs> All right, but you want to have those nice, nice sharp e um, edges for when you're trying to do this stuff. If, if you've got a blunt pencil, it just doesn't, it doesn't give you that bite. Um, the other thing is, once you've gone on with the pencil, 
You saw what happened earlier when I put the marker over the top of the pencil, it bled everywhere. All right, so pencil and final outlines after you've done your marker work. All right, so that's the order. Underlay, quick and dirty underlay with all your construction work. Overlay with a really light biro, light fine liner, or one of these friction pens. Apply your marker, then your pencil, then your final line work. That's the process for today. All right. I've spent a little bit too much time on the markers side of things, so I haven't really got into the complex um, shadows work. Uh, I will try and get. Well, I, I do have a video that I prepared earlier. Let me just.